In 1965, the uh, Sound of Music came out, and I was uh, 14 years or 13 years old at the time. And my family went, my little brother, uh, who was uh, younger than me, and my little sister. And it was so interesting to watch the movie and see the different reactions to the movie. Uh, it's based on a true story of the Von Trapp family singers. And the captain had seven uh, children. Uh, I, I don't remember what happened to his wife and the mother of the children. But the story revolves around the need for a governess. Uh, and that's where Julie Andrews comes in, a wannabe nun who gets her first assignment as the governor's of the children. Now, what I remember as a boy watching this was the first part of the movie was the gushy part. And that's where the captain and Maria, Julie Andrews, fall in love together in spite of the countess who is engaged to be the captain. And I remember that at one poignant moment in the first half of the movie, the captain is singing to Maria outside under the gazebo by moonlight. And, I, and I'm sitting there going, oh, oh. And, and I look over at my sister, and she's weeping like a baby. You so, this is so sweet. <laughs> well, then there was intermission. And then the last half of the movie, my brother and I were all in on because, because the Nazi SS guys were trying to find the Von Trapp family singers and, and arrest the captain. And, and somehow they made it through. Uh, that was the great part of the movie. Uh, to my brother and I. <clears throat> One of the things that was striking about the movie, and it still is if you see this, is that it's a picture of the different kinds of beauty that, that can be displayed by a woman. Uh, when it comes in the looks department, the countess had it all over young Maria, who was the, the wannabe nun and sort of had the goofy haircut and <laughs> And, uh, and the countess was sophisticated and, and, and mature and grown up. Uh, that, and, and both the countess and Maria knew in the looks department, the countess was the clear winner. But the captain fell in love, not with outer beauty, but with inner beauty. And he fell in love with Maria because there was something in her that just seemed to come out from her heart, her soul, and, and, and out through her countenance. And you could see it in a sparkle in her eye, you, you could see it in the way that she smiled, uh, e even the way that she listened or as she thought about how life was uh, and her sort of manner about how she lived her life. There was something coming out of her that, that just drew you to her, and it drew the, the captain. Uh, when I think about this, I think about the word alive. There was something alive in this woman that was almost dead and the countess. When my two girls were little, uh, we had a box out in our garage, which was kind of the playroom for us. Uh, and the box was sort of the, the princess uh, box. And it had all kinds of old clothes in it and shoes and a lot of costume jewelry. And, and uh, both of my girls would go out there and they would dress up. And I remember we had even a few old it might have been mother's or grandmother's nightgowns that my mother or Mindy's mother put in. Uh, and they became sort of the gowns for the ball. And, and my girls would love to, to, to dress up in this, and, and the, the dress and the makeup and the hair and the, and the big shoes that were the glass slippers. And they would come into the house and, Daddy, you want to hear my song? Or you want to see me dance? There was something in the heart of my girls, my feminine girls that wanted to be seen and wanted to be noticed. And we're, without really knowing it, we're asking a question uh, that every woman asks, is there something inside of me that, that is beautiful? Is there something inside of me that I have to contribute to the people in my life that will draw them, that, will, that where I can enjoy them and they will enjoy my company? Now, as, uh, as my girls grew up and probably you ladies grew up, uh, the world doesn't always cooperate with our dreams, uh, particularly when you get to the age of puberty and you start to kind of get that whole boys thing and, and boys are goofy and they, they don't make much sense and you have sort of dating dreams and you have some dating nightmares and then you go off to college uh, or that first job and you start in your 20s and you have relationships that you're you're, you're uh, dating and is, is he the one, could he be the one and finally you, you meet that guy 
and you're married, and uh, then a, a new reality strikes for, for many of you, and that is that you don't suddenly become Betty Crocker just because you said your vows to your husband. And after all of uh, three days, you've run out of recipes, and on day four, you're preparing Swanson TV dinners for you and your husband, and, and, and probably feeling this weight of guilt uh, on the side of you. And maybe you're channeling your mother and the advice that she gave you before. Um, and as you get into uh, adult life, you realize that being a woman in this world is not easy. Um, and it's very easy when those things, it's painful. It's very easy to hide. And when you ladies hide, uh, and men have the same, we have our own version of the same thing of hiding, that beauty that is given to your soul at, con at your conception remains hidden inside, locked. Whenever I try to protect myself from pain or I withdraw, that beauty remains under lock and key. And the story of God, the larger story in the ladies' lives, and, and men have their own version of this larger story too, is that the magic key that God gives you is other-centeredness, the other-centeredness of Jesus. And when you ladies become other-centered in relating with whoever it is you're talking to, then that treasure chest inside has a chance to open. And it has a chance for that, those rays to come out through your eyes and through your smile and through your demeanor. And people sense the invitational love of Jesus, even if they can't put words to that. That is what Peter calls inner beauty, and we're going to look at that uh, this morning, inner beauty. Larry Kravitz said, at the core of who we are, we are gendered. Uh, in spite of what our secular culture is trying to tell us, it is impossible to erase that. It's as much a part of who we are as our soul is. Our soul's center is alive with either masculinity or femininity. Now, people may not feel that as much as they would like to or hope to, but it's still there. Our uniquely gendered style of relating is clearly visible in our interactions when it reflects something wonderful about the relational nature of our God. And that's sort of the key idea here, is that when women get a vision for reflecting something of the invitational love of Jesus to the people that they relate to, inner beauty shines. This is when you will sense that in you and others will sense it too. Now this begs the question, well, what is beauty to start with? Um, and I'd like to say two things. Beauty originates with God. Beauty originates with God, the beauty of the Lord. The psalmist, David, Psalm 27, 4 said, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, what does he mean by the beauty of the Lord? In general, he means the beauty of God's character, the beauty of his holiness, the beauty of his love, the beauty of his faithfulness, the beauty of his sovereignty, the beauty of his justice. Uh, beauty is also seen in creation. Uh, Psalm 8, 1. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thou whose glory is above the heavens is chanted by the mouth of babes and infants. Thou hast founded a bulwark because of thy foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I think of thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast established, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou dost care for him. Yet thou hast made him little less than God and dost crown him with glory and honor. We have a chance to see a reflection of God's beauty in creation. Uh, also, his cause or his purposes, Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. This is a tremendous Bible promise for his people. And then also we see his, his beauty the most at the cross. When Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And what he's describing here is the beauty of one completely innocent dying for a whole race of guilty people like you and me. There is beauty in that sacrifice. 
Now, secondly, and particularly as it relates to women, and this would be a different application for men, and this is on the inside of your handout, this is mostly seen, seen it seems to me, in the invitational love of Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Now, what he's describing here are people who are discouraged by life. They're depressed, they're tired, they're tired of going on, of having to persevere, getting up another day and slogging through life. This is who he's talking to. He says, come to me. What does he offer? I will give you rest. Now, he's not talking about two weeks in Hawaii. He's talking about something that our soul needs in a very difficult world that we live in. A chance for our soul to relax, to be at peace, or what uh, the Hebrew word is shalom. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, that's a model, it seems to me. If I was a woman, this is the verse I would think about when I was trying to... to uh, what does it mean to relate to my husband and to my children and to the people at work and to my neighbors? I would think about the invitational love of Jesus. Now, how do you know when this, when this happens? How do you know when, when somebody is experiencing your inner beauty? How does this happen? And, and I have some, uh, some notes in your handout here. Um, uh, and, and I don't claim to be perfect on this at all. But this is just my observation both personally when I am refreshed by the invitational love of Jesus or, or expressed through a, a woman. Somebody understands your struggles and they're not trying to fix your struggles. Third, they allow you to speak of your struggles in a judgment-free atmosphere. Four, and they still enjoy you and your company in spite of your struggles and five, this person seems to be more committed to you after hearing your struggles than before. And there's something that happens in this kind of relationship where you just go, oh. your heart has a chance to rest. It has a chance to be at peace. Somebody understands the difficulty in my life and they're still for me. This is the invitational love of Jesus and it's when it, when it's expressed through an other-centered woman, it mirrors him almost exactly. Um, inner beauty is the topic of uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. And Peter mentions four things in here, four aspects of inner beauty that puts some more specificity to this. But the, the chapter starts out, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Now, he is not saying that these things are bad or that they're ungodly. He's just saying that if, when it comes to outer beauty and inner beauty, in the long game, you want to be playing the inner beauty game because over time, time takes its toll on outer beauty, but on inner beauty, time works, can work in your favor towards beauty. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. And so I like the four things he mentions here. I'd like just to briefly go over. The first is a gentle spirit. Now he's not talking about somebody that's an introvert or doesn't say much or doesn't have an opinion. He's talking about a character quality, a spirit that comes out of this person, an attitude that you sense from this person. A gentle spirit. It's the word praus, P-R-A-U-S, the Greek word. It's the same word that is used back in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, that just where Jesus says, I am gentle and humble in heart. It's the same Greek word. The idea of somebody who is gentle, the root word means somebody that with, without an inflated sense of self. In relationship, you don't sense that what's really going on here is sort of the first me and then you, that this person has something they want to say or they want to display or there's knowledge that, or they want to be heard. This is the opposite. This is the person who's interested in you, who's curious about you. You don't sense in a gentle spirit, please come through for me. Or why, why, why do we not talk that much like we used to? That's sort of the opposite of a gentle spirit. A quiet spirit 
is the Greek word huskios. And the word itself in, in imagery means to keep your seat. Now, it doesn't mean to keep your seat in a bad way. It means to, that this, this person is able to keep their seat in a good way. When all of life is falling apart, this person is able to keep their seat. There's something inside of them that is not freaking out. It's not going nuts. That, that, that's scrambling to, make, to, to, to manage you or to manage your life or to get something fixed. Uh, the word is sometimes translated unmoved or uh, at peace. I think of this as calm in a crisis. Or calm when your life isn't going the way you want. Or calm when your husband or your kids are not relating to you the way that you want them to. Or people at work are not relating. There's something that's still quiet in the heart that's anchored. Now, when I think of these two things together, the imagery <clears throat> that, that I always think of is a high school football game I went to years ago. Uh, and and our, I think it was at Irvine High School, and our team was just getting shellacked. And most of the student body had left, I think, except for girlfriends of the players um, and the parents of the players. And I was sitting there in the fourth quarter thinking, why am I still here? I mean, it was just, it was an atrocious game. And it was starting to get cold, and it seemed like the game would just, the fourth quarter seemed like it went on for days. And the other team scored a touchdown, and it went from 42 to nothing to 48 to nothing. And, and I'm just kind of like, oh, will this game ever end? And then the next thing I remember, it, 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 it so caught my attention because it seemed so unintuitive or paradoxical is that the cheerleaders got their pom-poms, and they have these boxes that they stand on, and the 12 of us who seemed to be left in my section of the stands, they were going, block that kick, block that kick. And I remember thinking, you know, I thought, block that kick, block that kick. I remember thinking, you know, the difference between 48 to nothing and 49 to nothing is not that great a thing. And besides that, I remember thinking, I don't think our guys are going to block the kick. We, we, we haven't blocked anything all night. <laughs> but, it, but, but suddenly in the moment, I thought, oh my gosh, these are daughters of Eve who are leading us in cheers. And even if they, even if they can't put words to this, they intuitively know that those 11 guys on the field are feeling like complete failures. They are, they, they are living in shame, public shame, in front of the, the people who are still at the game and the people who are the other players that are on the bench and the coaches. And I thought, you know, some of those players are probably glad they're not on the field. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is more than just they're doing their job as a cheerleader. What struck me was the femininity that is, that is given to you ladies in your gender was at work. And what it, was, what it realized was those guys on the field need somebody that still believes in them, even when they don't believe in themselves anymore. And I thought, you know, behind, it's almost like they could see underneath that helmet and behind that face mask was a defeated young man that needed some encouragement. That's, as I think about this picture here, that's what I think of as a gentle and quiet spirit. Somebody that can see the failure or discouragement or the battles that are being waged and sometimes that other people are losing, and yet you are still for them. That is beautiful to somebody when they're struggling. Those are the first two aspects of this. The third one is she puts her hope in God. 1 Peter 3, 5 says, This is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. Now, he's not saying who put their hope in God that God would, would suddenly make their life like they want it to be. Now, when, when that happens, that's a nice thing. We're all for that. But there are lots of times in life where God doesn't arrange life to be the way you like it to be and where it's more difficult than it is. Um, and so what does he mean by hope? Here, the idea of hope is simply God is telling a story, no matter how difficult my life may be, 
He is still telling that story, and my part is to reflect the, the invitational love of God to the people in my life. And through that story, his story progresses. It moves forward. Hope in God. Um, oftentimes, when life goes bad, we um, uh, try to pressure the people in our life to make life better. Uh, or we communicate a message that you're not doing enough to make life better for me or our children. Um, and that's the opposite of this. Uh, whenever you and I feel pressure, that's a, that's a red flag. Uh, I'm on the wrong side of this story. Pressuring somebody, I'm on the wrong side of the story. And then the fourth one is probably the most misunderstood term uh, in our culture when it comes to the church world, and that is the word submission. Submission. Verse 5 says, this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Now in Ephesians 5, 22, uh, 21, uh, starts the passage on marriage. Every one of us in church life, in our family life, we, and uh, we are to submit to one another. Uh, I am the, I'm the, at the head of the chart of, in our church. Um, but uh, I willingly and eagerly submit to the people that I work with, to our elders and to our staff and, and to our leaders. Um, and and that's, that's a positive thing. Submission is a positive thing. It's a wise thing to do. Uh, voluntarily uh, submit. I was watching a, a um, 30 for 30 on Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells, uh, NFL coaches, and uh, Bill Parcells, even though he was a very, very strong leader, also trusted his defensive coordinator and his, his offensive coordinator and assistant coaches a lot, voluntarily submitting to them. When I think about how our culture thinks about this word submission, and particularly in marriage, they, they, they think in terms of value that the husband is of greater value and the wife is of lesser value, and that is not what this means. Submission is not a question of value, but it's a matter of role. In the business world, when you take on a job, you are expected to submit to the boss and to the job. Um, and as long as you can do that and the boss thinks you're profitable for the company, you still have a job and get paid. It is not appropriate to rebel against the boss and to do your own thing unless you're really looking for another kind of job or maybe even another kind of career. The, the business world understands submission. It's a matter of role, not importance. The military also understands this. All the way from the private, all the way to the chief of armed forces, everyone has to submit to the one, to the rank above them. The only one that doesn't in this is the President of the United States, the Commander in Chief. But everybody has to submit. That's part of their role in terms of leadership and following. The same is true uh, in our relational world. If you go to school to volunteer at your kid's school, uh, it's assumed uh, and you should rightly assume that if you're going to help, you're really going to help in line with what the, how the teacher wants you to help or how the school wants you to help, it's not appropriate to just go up there and just kind of do what you want to do, no matter what the teacher wants or what the school wants. There's something wise about submission and about finding your role in that. And the same is true in marriage. Uh, I've been talking to couples for many, many decades. And I'm always amazed by the difference between gender. For us guys, generally speaking, it's hard for us to figure out the nuances of close relationship. Now, I teach this stuff. I do this stuff. But I mean, I struggle with this still at, you know, at my age. It, it, my, my radar, my antenna are not nearly as uh, advanced as the radar and antenna even of young girls, like when my daughters were little or teenagers, or young adults, or older adults. You ladies have an ability to sort of figure out what it is that you have in your husband's strengths and what you don't have in his weaknesses. 
And you have the ability to sort of find your way, in spite of those things, to make this teamwork thing work. Whereas it's much more difficult for a man to see the same nuances because we just don't seem to have the same kind of radar or antenna that you do. It's something of this is what, is what Peter is describing here in submission. It's finding your place in the teamwork of husband and wife. And when that happens, when that happens, beauty is one of the effects. And when beauty is one of the effects, beauty has a chance to draw a husband to herself. It's an amazing thing. Well, on the back of your handout, I want us to, to uh, think about the effect of beauty. What is the effect of beauty in relationship? And I think that this is where a God and an other-centered woman sort of sing a duet with, with the people in her life. Uh, beauty is an unspoken language. It just sort of happens. It just sort of in the atmosphere. Uh, and it's almost like God's messenger to us, calling us to look up to him. Uh, when I think of this, I think of five different things. They're on the back of your handout. Beauty says, all is well. Now, it doesn't mean that all of life is well or that circumstances aren't well uh, or, or they're, they're good. Uh, sometimes life is a wreck. Uh, I've talked to some people this week who are dealing with cancer and the uncertainty of cancer. Uh, you know, that uh, our own, you know, we lost uh, uh, Sarah a few weeks ago, um, Sarah Mansell. Uh, life is not okay in those situations. However, at a deeper level, because we know God and are anchored with him, then all will be well. Someday, all will be well. Proverbs 31, 25 is a great, great verse of this. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. And by days to come, he means difficulty. There's something that anchors this woman, and it, and it evokes beauty. Uh, beauty also invites Song of Solomon 2, 3. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. There's something there that, that draws people to yourself when they sense something other-centered pouring out of you. Third, beauty comforts. And I love this story in Matthew 26, 10, um, <clears throat> where Jesus was at a, at a dinner party, and, and Mary uh, at that party takes out ointment and anoints his feet and anoints his head and rubs his feet with her hair. And Judas gets all bent out of shape about this. And Jesus uh, says, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. She's put herself out in a vulnerable position in a public place to give something of herself to Jesus. And Jesus says, that's beauty. The poor you will always have with you, Judas, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. There was something other-centered that prompted her to do this. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Beauty comforts. It also inspires. Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. There's something about beauty uh, that inspires. Uh, I love to go to Colorado. Uh, I don't get to go th there that often as I uh, would really like to. But when I go to the Rocky Mountains, there's something about being up in those mountains that inspires me. Uh, sometimes when I go to Newport Beach and, and stand on the bluffs looking out over the ocean, which I don't do very often anymore, but, I, but the memory of that stays with me. And there's something about that in, that inspires me. Um, and I think that what those pictures do for me, those pictures of beauty, is they say to me, there's, there's almost like a, a promise. It says, this is what life is going to be like one day. You're going to enjoy this world that I have for you a lot more than you enjoy the one you're in now. And then beauty is transcendent. 
There's something about beauty that evokes me heavenward. It says there's a greater story going on in life than just my little story in my everyday life. Isaiah 33, 17 is a great verse for this. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. There's a vision there about what's coming. And he can see it even now as he's thinking about that, how life will be. When I think of this, I just want to end with a story and a poem. Uh, 14 years ago, we had um, uh, a woman that had just been coming to our church for a pretty short time. And she was diagnosed with cancer. Her name was Judy. And, um, and she and I and uh, her husband, we became friends. And uh, it wasn't too long afterward that the doctor gave her a really, really rough prognosis that the cancer was likely terminal. And of course, that rocked both of them. And they had two uh, young daughters. I think they were both in junior high, roughly. And over the next several months or so, I got to know uh, she and her husband quite well. And uh, she was in and out of the hospital a number of times, not at Hogue Hospital. And I remember going down to Hogue Hospital and sitting in the chair uh, in her room. And uh, she and I would talk. And, and it was just so strange because she was one of those people that, you know, I was the visitor there going to comfort her. And yet, almost every time I left, it seemed like that uh, she was the visitor coming to comfort me. Um, and as I sat in that chair, we would chat. You know how hospitals are. The doctor would come in and check the chart, and the nurse would come in and check the chart. And you've got people checking vitals and checking medicine, and you've got the, the people coming in to clean things. Um, and every time somebody came in, it was an event. It was almost like, you know, the, the royalty just walked through the door. And sh there was something of this feminine beauty, this inner beauty that Peter's talking about that just came rolling out of her towards this person. And I remember just thinking, this is like being in a movie, like a real movie. I, I, I'm in the movie, and I'm watching a movie that Jesus is producing and he is doing this through Judy uh, as, he, as she relates to the different people in spite of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with cancer. Uh, it's just kind of mesmerizing. Uh, as, as the cancer advanced, she was in the hospital more often, and, and there were times I'd go down there uh, after dinner, and, um, which is probably not a good time to go, as I discovered, because... Uh, there were times when she and I were chatting, you know, like maybe 9 o'clock at night, and, uh, and she would fall asleep while we were chatting. Um, it made me wonder about my conversational ability here. <laughs> um, but there was something so electric, so wondrous about what Jesus was doing in this woman that I remember at times where even after she was asleep in her bed, and I'm over in the corner of the room in the chair, there was something in me that didn't want to leave. It was almost like beauty was still hanging in the air, still inviting, still saying, Seth, this is what I'm like. Come to me, you who are heavy laden and burdened, and you will find rest for your souls. When I think about this message today for you ladies, we've been doing a series called The Larger Story. This is God's larger story in your life. What is he trying to do in you? This. A few years ago, I wrote a, I wrote a, um, a poem about this, and it's sort of the, I call it the redemption of the feminine heart, and it sort of sums up the message, what I'm trying to say today. A thing of rare beauty inside a woman's heart, a jewel that invites you to rest and to be a part an invitation, warm, receives you to her side. Sweet enjoyment found there, like warmth of fireside. Why does this beauty hide? Concealed behind her fear? Shrouded under cover? Afraid that you might sneer? Insecure and fearful? Haunted by rejection? I won't invite. I fear 
loss of your affection. Then Satan's whispers heard, you have nothing to give. Play it safe. Don't engage. If you do, you'll misgive. Satan's sly plan at work. She's curved in on herself. And there the jewel will hide alone and by itself. Her heart peeks through the cracks of self-protective walls, looking for when it's safe to thwart rejection's calls. Her heart sits in shadows, numb and given up hope that she will be wanted. Control helps her to cope. Through the years, cobwebs grow, her heart in shadows dimmed. Heart's curtains are closing, her candle wicks are trimmed. A crusty shell hardens, is she trapped in her skin? Unwanted and unloved, vile lies echo within. All the voices she hears, and her own voice as well, the choir of despair sings her dulled heart's death knell. But a lion's voice roars. God calls across the land. He will not let her go. The search for her is at hand. He rides with sword and sun, a horse as strong as rock. The sword can pierce heart's walls and crush her cinder blocks. The sun burns her cobwebs and shadows fade and wince. Prison doors are unlocked. The princess meets her prince. God made your beauty's jewel back before you were born. Though you try and hide it, it cannot be unborn. Let the prince have your heart. He'll find your beauty's gleam. He makes radiant hearts. God's beauty is meant to beam. You see it in her smile, born from God's love for her. Shines like the morning dawn, sweet as a kitten's purr. That gleam that's in her eyes gives life to all around. Her heart teems with this life, with his life. I find myself spellbound. She mirrors Jesus' heart Invitational love. Come, all you who are weary, find peace here like a dove. A place to bear your soul midst hardship and trials. A harbor, refreshment, enjoyment, gleams, and smiles. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the ladies who I've had the privilege of knowing and being loved like this. Um, my mother, uh, grandmother, my wife, my daughters, and a lot of ladies in this church who have exhibited this kind of beauty. And it is so refreshing. It inspires. It draws. It speaks. What, what unlocks that treasure in the heart of self-protection? Only the cross of Jesus Christ, the key that makes it possible to trust God enough to bear your soul to the people around you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the freedom that you give us and continue to grow in us and continue to give to us as we simply yield ourselves to you and become more concerned and care more about those around us than we do ourselves at any given moment. And I pray that uh, for all who hear this message, that you would encourage their hearts, help them to get a vision for what you are trying to do in their lives, and that they may continue to reflect the wonder of the beauty of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.